questions? Yeah. Got it. Okay. I'm sharing. I'm starting to share. And then, yeah, that's this is it. Hi, everyone. Thanks uh, for inviting. I, it's It's been a great pleasure to work on this topic for me, and um, I really hope you'll enjoy it. Okay, so we're going to talk today about humor as a worldview, how Ukrainians are joking about the war, why we are joking about the war this way, how come that we make these kind of jokes and so often, and what kind of jokes uh, have been created um, during this time. So my name is Daria Ansubor. I am an anthropologist, a folklorist. I also got a PhD in philology because folklore studies are a part of philology field in Ukraine. So uh, yeah, without further ado, let's start with uh, <laughs> at the beginning, we are going to talk a little bit about the folklore genres. Um, so I would like uh, to start maybe with uh, you know, this uh, constant belief that folklore genres are mostly like fairy tales, legends, maybe some carols, uh, proverbs, things like this. So you don't really think so much about memes when we talk about folklore genres, but actually a modern folklore text is the text that uh, can be basically anything that I would like to spread spontaneously, yeah, with a, a group of people who has the same values and, uh, who shares the same hopes as I do. So basically the, the trick is that this text has to convey spontaneously, convey information and hopes and beliefs that value for some group of people, uh, some people in this group. So memes actually are perhaps the most vivid examples of these kind of texts. And uh, these are not just jokes, yeah? So when, of course they make us laugh, but also they, uh, it's not a very uh, it's not very easy to think how they appear because there is also some specific manner how it did, how it is done. So and also there is a specific thing why we are using it. So basically, the term itself appeared uh, in the seventies, and uh, the writer Richard Dawkins in his book called the uh, uh, egoistic uh, the selfish gene. Uh, describe this as a unit of cultural transmission or a unit of imitation. So what he did, he basically, he created this term uh, that would sound very similar to the word gene, but he also took the Greek root uh, from the word mimem, which uh, basically we can translate as uh, something which is imitated. So <clears throat> what he did, he created a mix of these uh, two words, something that can be imitated and can be transferred as a gene. So uh, both the gene and the meme can be replicators and both can, be, can become viral. So this term was then appropriated to refer specifically to one particular type of replicable unit of culture. So this, it means that meme uh, can replicate itself and can do it in very different time and in very different basically space as well. So success of transmitting this kind of things as memes that we are going to talk about today uh, depends on few factors. So the first thing is it depends on the barriers willing to share this kind of meme. Uh, secondly, it depends on the society's uh, request, uh, the topics that we would like to cover with these memes. And thirdly, it, the, memes should, the meme should be relevant. So for this, if these three uh, uh, factors are hit in one meme, then it means that this meme will become viral. So how, yeah. So memes help us to feel who we are, they help us to represent ourselves. And uh, actually it's quite interesting to see that following the Russian uh, full-scale military invasion, Ukrainians started to uh, feel this need to demark to express themselves and to express the sense of personal identity at all levels. And uh, it's quite interesting to see that uh, Ukrainian culture is not longer stereotyped uh, as rudimentary and people started to basically rethink their own values, you know, to challenge their own knowledge about the past and uh, the things that we've learned before, everything is start started to be, um, you know, started to be questioned because uh, 
uh, this identity started also to be challenged in a way that we had to uh, uh, get to know more about our own history, uh, to decolonize our own past uh, from this Russian imperial uh, background, from the Soviet background, and all these uh, things uh, appear in the memes as well. So society needs to develop a sense of personal identity and uh, basically revise everything that we, we've gone through. And society wants self-determination and rethinking. And uh, so, uh, yeah, so it is not uh, all surprising that we often can see also the humor in a way that uh, this kind of things uh, are being shown through humor. So what I would like you to start uh, to start with you is that I would like to show you this picture that represents very well the situation our society is uh, going on through uh, these holidays. The trick is, <laughs> the problem is that one part of the society wants to already have all these Western values and celebrate Christmas and St. Nicholas Day the same way as the Western world. And another part is still uh, maybe, you know, kind of trying to uh, fix uh, their own um, knowledge about these previous past uh, identities that we've got from the Soviet Union, for example, when the New Year is the first holiday that we have to celebrate, and then on the 7th of January we have Christmas. So uh, the calendar, the shift with the calendars uh, is quite, uh, uh, mm, not, it's not really interesting to watch, but it's also interesting to figure out how you how you also find yourself in this situation. And basically what we've got in this meme is that we have St. Nicholas from the 6th of December, then the St. Nicholas that we've got on the 19th of December, then we've got the traditional Western and uh, that uh, is the year Christmas Day when we would like to continue to celebrate it this way on the 25th of December. Then we've got Santa Claus, then we've got Father Frost, Grandfather Frost that is um, has now very strong connection with the Russian context, but originally it was originated from the 19th century actually. And also yeah, the 7th of January, this is the last part when we have the second uh, birthday of Jesus Christ. That's quite complicated, but this is how it, it's been done here. Uh, so uh, firstly, I would like to talk a little bit about the, um, I would say, folkloric traditional um, context of uh, humor. And then we will move on with uh, the, um, yeah, the memes from the war. So. In the folk culture, which you have to maybe know, is that the folk culture uh, always tends to feel that laughing is only for a life. So if you laugh, it means that you're alive, because dead people can't uh, laugh. And um, in the fairy tales, often you can see when the hero enters the tri um, Tristan kingdom and he is banned from laughing, eating, drinking, uh, sleeping, and so on. So all these things that um, the person who is alive can do, but the dead person can't. So if you laugh, it means that you blow your cover and you reveal that you are alive. And then uh, the, the fairy tale starts to be really not a fairy tale at all because the people from the underworld, they never laugh. So the traditional culture is very carnivalese, I would say, carnivalesque, because uh, when you... Uh, when you see all these sprites that we usually have in Ukraine and in other territories as well, not only in Ukraine, but in Ukraine, it's um, it's a very popular, very common, very interesting tradition was dressing up in this carnival way for Malanka. And Malanka is uh, celebrated uh, after the New Year's, after, after Christmas, actually. And uh, so this is a a tradition mostly in the western, west, not, uh, western and southern part of Ukraine, uh, and uh, it's very well preserved in the areas which is close to Romania. And the trick here is that, uh, yeah, people wear very fancy, very strange costumes, and uh, they have to play songs, they have to um, scream, they have to ring the bells, and things like this. So everything goes upside down, and the lower ties of the social hierarchy are are purposely raised and uh, to higher levels and uh, vice versa. So everything which was on the top starts to be on the bottom and everything which was on the bottom starts to be on the top. And uh, uh, then later, when we look in this uh, tradition of humor in Ukraine, 
you would see that um, uh, it goes back for, uh, to the Baroque times. So the traveling persons were the students in the 16th and the 17th century uh, who uh, were studying in the academy uh, for, for priests, basically. And they performed, uh, they were really, really poor and they wanted to, you know, to gain some more money for their education. So what they did, they basically traveled from one city to another, from one village to another, and they performed on these uh, market squares and taverns and hot houses, at the weddings, at the funerals. They didn't really care where to perform, but they just wanted to perform. I, I would call them the Baroque stand-up comedians of that day. And uh, they were practicing satire, satire while using both academic knowledge and also this folklore tradition that was very common back then. And uh, later, this uh, tradition was used by this guy, Ivan Kotlerevsky. He created an Aida that was the first Ukrainian, uh, the first uh, Ukrainian burlesque poem written in 1798. And the trick here, the coolest thing is that it was a mock heroic poem. So he basically he used the, it was a parody of Virgil's Aeneid, and uh, he transformed uh, Trojan heroes uh, into the Prussian Cossacks, and also he published everything in modern Ukrainian language, and that was a hit. Like it was, a, it was an amazing, amazing book that was spread. <laughs> all over the country, people were citing it. And later on, uh, he inspired lots of other writers, including this guy, Ostap Vyshnya. Uh, his parodies were very, very famous in uh, the Soviet time. And he was so popular that uh, more than 1 million books were sold in Ukrainian language, which is quite cool, if you think about that, especially in Soviet time. And uh, another part of this, uh, of the tradition of humor is, of course, uh, connected with the satirical magazines. Uh, this is from the early 20th century. It's called The Pepper, and uh, it lasted till late 80s. <clears throat> and this is the Makita the Fox. Uh, this was uh, very popular in the diaspora. And uh, another part of the story is, of course, the TV shows. So what we've got here is, uh, starting from the 60s, the club of the funny and inventive, Kaven. And uh, basically, I guess we all know about Zelensky, who was a part of Portal 95 since 1997. And they started as the group, yes, as the band in this club. And later on, after the invasion started in uh, 2014, they decided to create their own branch, basically their own uh, show, Love League since uh, 2015 and uh, it's because this club of funny the funny and inventive was very for russian and it was impossible to continue doing anything together with them anymore and uh, now i would say that uh this is the blooming part <laughs> for stand-up comedians right now this is the period when they are the, the time when they are super popular and uh, lots of stand-ups uh, are going on every every week and uh, so uh, you can, sh I'll give you some links in the end. Uh, so you will, if you want, you can show, you can see some of them, they're also in English. Uh, okay, so now <laughs> coming back to this topic of uh, uh, war. Uh, so basically in the time uh, when there is a huge crisis, humor and satire help to survive and uh, they help to basically cope with these very difficult situations. And the researchers, typically, the researchers typically record a spike of this uh, humor during a very some emergencies, like for example, natural disasters or military uh, conflicts or epidemics or some other catastrophes. And in Ukraine, you can also see it very well with the jokes about Chernobyl, for example, from 1986. That these uh, jokes basically got their revival after the news about the Russians who had dug trenches in the extremely contaminated area of the Red Forest in uh, Chernobyl. So what you've got here is uh, the original text. For example, of course, there were no real memes back then in 1986 when Chernobyl disaster happened. 
but there were lots of lots of jokes you know uh, lots of legend um, urban legends and uh, um, sadistic poems and stuff like this so uh late and they inspired some of the memes from about this Chernobyl period of time when the Russians came there so for example here you see Don messing up was a red forest red because the uh, trees were so contaminated that they, they turned into a red color and uh, here you see that uh, the Russians that they can't understand where they are that 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 was quite shocking for Ukrainians as well to realize that uh, these people don't really get what what's going on there what was going on so they say here that is it uh, can we really eat it and they say of course and here is a great meme about Chernobylka and Chernobyl so Chernobylka was an airport is an airport where in the suburbs basically of Kherson, uh, where uh, the uh, Russian Russians kept uh, trying to use their helicopters, and the Ukrainians were constantly shelling them there. And uh, so there is a meme in this part. How can how can you figure out if you are Vanka, like if you're a Russian soldier? Yeah, your your Russian guy was in Chernobylka or in Chernobyl. So that's how you can figure out. This is Chernobylka one, Chernobylka five, Chernobylka twelve, and this is uh, Chernobyl if it's Pripyat, if it's uh, the station, and if it's this red forest. Um, so basically, yeah, if you can laugh about something, it means that you can. Uh, it's not scary anymore, yeah? So humor helps us to comprehend emergency situations, to adapt more quickly, also to really to survive because it helps you to stay normal, you know, somehow with your mental health. Um, it gives you power to fight back. And it also, it's very serious that memes help us to reflect the general consensus. Because if it's funny for me and if it's funny for you, then we are on the same page. Yeah, so we have the same attitude. So um, I would say that one of the, okay, so topics of course are changing, yeah, constantly depending on the situation and the battlefield, depending on this current situations, current problems that we've had. Uh, but uh, I would say that mocking Russians, this is the constant thing. So you can see it, uh, it, it never changes. So mocking Russians, Russian propaganda, Russian soldiers, yeah, Russian uh, politicians, this is uh, intelligence, so-called good Russians and so on. So this is the thing that helps us to stay, uh, <laughs> yeah, I would say to, uh, to, to stay calm and to stay still and to stay focused. So smoking Russians, showing them as very weak, showing them as unprofessional, as um, disgraceful uh, enemies. Uh, helps to dehumanize them and uh, also of course not to feel fear anymore towards them so there is also a very huge need to distinguish one from another because of course um, before the full-scale war started a lot of people all over the world couldn't even find out where the where ukraine is yeah and uh, how different are ukrainians or uh, ukrainians are from russians and how different languages or if it's the same language and things like this so this need basically helps us to set up also the, the mains also help us to set up boundaries between these two nations and show um, and point out the differences in dividing them. Uh, and um, this, this is something that helps us also a lot to understand and to rethink this colonial past that I've uh, told you before. So when we become frustrated, when we are scared, the simplest reaction is to laugh, uh, to laugh out, off and uh, it's a natural psychological reaction and uh, it helps us to release stress and uh, also it is a, a very interesting thing that we have to know that humor is always darker when it's closer to you to closer to you in a time of event or in the space as well so black humor also helps us to survive these difficult situations when experience is so painful that i can't really express it put it into words but i can laugh through the memes, for example. But it is also quite I'm curious maybe to see that uh, Ukrainians don't really have this typical gallows folklore, uh, that uh, we are dealing here not with the typical gallows folklore, because the difference is that Ukrainians do not really think about themselves as uh, sentenced, you know, as people who are going to die. We always think that we are going to win, and it's that's um, a crucial difference, I would say. So Ukrainians found hope, 
they find uh, boldness maybe and stress in this kind of memes uh, through dehumanizing the Russians and also through hyperbolizing themselves. And uh, one of these examples is, of course, with sunflower seeds, because uh, uh, maybe you've remembered that uh, on the first days of the full-scale invasion, a woman, one woman suggested uh, Russian soldiers to fill their pockets with sunflower seeds so that uh, their deaths wouldn't be so senseless. And um, that became also a part of a huge, um, maybe a story, a full story, a whole myth uh, about uh, Russian soldiers being killed and then being uh, uh, regrown as yeah, rebirth, I don't know, get their birth as sunflowers. So um, here you see, first of all, it's because there are so many soldiers that were basically left on the battlefield and no one took care of their bodies at all. So it actually became a huge problem, uh, especially in the summer. So because there were lots of pigs who were running around and basically eating these uh, corpses. And also, so this, this particular meme is actually about the way how, um, how dehumanized the Russian people actually are for us and also for themselves as well. And also the, it's kind of a symbol of hope as well because everything will be finished and then we're gonna see only sunflowers here. So this is a meme where, this, where you see, this is a picture where you see, it's written that there is a portrait of unknown Russian soldier. And here you see, you can see it's written the Ukrainian hearts uh, need uh, sunflowers. And this is the basically this lady who, uh, who said, uh, that uh, who, who is uh, planting some seeds, yeah, on uh, the ground, and you see already that that's that's about this soldier, and it's quite interesting also to see that uh, usually uh, some nations would have uh, stereotypical uh, nicknames here yeah, for their uh, neighbors, and with Russians uh, and Ukrainians, so usually Ukrainians would say Katsap or Moscow for Russians people, and Russian would usually call us uh, Hohol. But uh, it's not about food. <laughs> but what is quite interesting here is that with memes, we started to use a lot of um, food analogies uh, with Russians. And usually it's about minced meat or about their analogy with um, cannon fodder and fertilizers, as we were just talking about with sunflowers before. Yeah, so it's basically, yeah, the, the, the trick here is that the Russian soldier will be a fertilizer for our land. And so extreme military loss is actually the first reason why everything happened here in the, with this memes, why they started to appear. So the losses uh, suffered by Russian army, uh, when the dead bodies were left behind, or fallen soldiers were left behind, no one took care of them, and they were just uh, basically left to rot on the battlefield, because, uh, and that became the main reason why we have these memes about mm, mm, fertilizers. Yeah, so here you have the typical Russian father trying to pick his uh, son uh, back from the uh, special operation in Ukraine. Uh, I'm going to uh, tell a little bit more about this newspeak. And here you say, uh, here it is written that the, how Ukrainians used to make uh, mincemeat before the war and how they're doing it now. And here you see, that's my favorite. So you see that the Russian losses were so vast that the stray dogs started to appear in memes that they couldn't, basically they couldn't even proce process so much food. So they started to be really obese and they were like, oh God, no, please, no, don't tell me that we have to go there again. Yeah, so basically they, what they're saying here, gosh, I'm so full, I can't even move, you know? But another dog is saying that, okay, but we have to move on because the Russians are going, uh, are, yeah, are killing some more, some, the, the Ukrainians are killing some more Russians. And uh, okay, if we have to do it, then okay, I'll try. But, but basically, there's a lot of memes about very, very fat animals that they're they are struggling because there's so much meat. And um, another thing is that we are starting to see here is um, the uh, yeah, the metaphor metaphor of making shashlik. So uh, grilled meat, namely. Uh, the shashlik became a popular symbol of Ukraine's victory over the Russians 
and Ukraine's activities uh, aimed for disrupting Russian military for, uh, efforts. And um, it's quite interesting also because we have some also like inner joke, I would say, like local Ukrainian joke about it, because Shashlik was also a reference uh, to all their messages uh, from January when Zelensky, uh, President Zelensky, was trying to calm down people. And basically what he was doing, he was saying that, don't worry, we will make Shashlik during holidays in May. And of course, this, um, like, you know, he he already knew, of course, that there was going to be an invasion very soon. But um, like, it, it's still quite you know, uh, it's a question, mm, questionable thing in Ukrainian society, but um, he really, he was saying that, uh, yeah, we are going to make shashliks. And another thing is that in um, uh, a year ago, yeah, last uh, summer, he had also a meeting with journalists, uh, uh, some, yeah, and he was, well, that that was exactly what he was doing with this journalist in their meeting. He was making shashliks with them. So Zelensky had already his own history with shashlik, and now it started to be a new page in his relationship with this meal, uh, with this dish. And uh, another very popular meme is with uh, Commander in Chief Valery Zaluzhny, who is uh, typically portrayed looking over a cauldron, uh, which in Ukrainian uh, means uh, also military trap. So it means that the Russian uh, forces are surrounded, like 360 uh, 60 degrees. They are completely surrounded. And he is, uh, yeah, so basically he is watching how they are boiling or what. Yeah. And um, while talking about <laughs> um, food memes, we, we should also remember the Belarusians. So um, if with Russians, we always have this, uh, the, this food, uh, the context was meat. Then with Belarusian, it's also, actually is their traditional stereotypical dish uh, with the potato. Yeah. So usually we call them deruni. This, these are derunis. Basically, they are like uh, pancakes made of uh, like latkes made of uh, potatoes, potato troops, or bulba shev. Bulba means potato in uh, Belarusian. And uh, it's very common belief that Belarusian cuisine uses a lot of potatoes. And uh, so for this reason, you can hear a lot of stereotypical phrases, uh, yeah, stereotypical names uh, um, that are connected uh, somehow with potatoes. So uh, potato is also believed to be the most popular dish in Belarusian cuisine. So as a result, uh, you have all, all this, all the memes with the way how you're gonna sm smash and mesh <laughs> Belarusian army if they come. And here is here it is. Uh, for example, it says that Belarus uh, um, got some um, fake tanks, like uh, artificial tanks, on the border with Ukraine. And uh, so the meme says that's how they look. That how they look like. And also, for Lukashenko, sometimes it's called pure from pure, like mashed potato. And uh, yeah, this are the the weapon that we are going to use against them. So the jokes, all these jokes, aim to objectify the enemy, of course, belittle them, and make fun of the invaders. And uh, so this way, of course, they are less terrifying, and uh, we believe that we are stronger this way. Uh, when we talk about the internationally, yeah, internationally popular memes, I would of course uh, I would put here hijacked tanks. I think that was number one. Uh, and we talk about the popular memes from Ukraine and about Ukraine uh, this year. So Ukrainian farmers who hijacked or uh, steal the tanks from the Russian army, this is a, a very popular meme. So you see, and sometimes tanks started to be more like uh, um, dehumanized, but humanized. So they, we see that they are uh, they can they are trying to hear where the tank is. They are putting their head towards the ground, trying to hear where where they are. Or uh, here it's quite funny to see that uh, the ship is saying like, "Oh, we are on the water. Don't we are we don't have to worry about uh, the crazy Ukrainian tractors." But then you see, "Hi there, you're from Ukraine," and you see this monstrous um, amphibia. I don't know tractor coming. And this is, of course, the allusion also to this uh, warship um, in Moskva, that there were also lots of tanks, uh, lots of memes about uh, the underwater tractors that were trying to find Moskva and uh, also to get it back for, to Ukraine. 
Um, and another quite, uh, I would say, popular topic was, of course, looting, because uh, Russians, uh, after uh, after they uh, retreated from the northern part of Ukraine, uh, the world saw some crazy, crazy things. And uh, also, they were because of this interception calls that were spread by our intelligence, um, uh, people also got heard more and more quite unusual personal stories when, for example, a woman could call her husband and say that, okay, we need sneakers uh, size 37, don't forget a blender, and I also need a laptop. And of course, everything was uh, also made into memes. And um, so here you see a Russian soldier uh, coming back home, um, like expectation reality. Expectation is, of course, with a new uh, TV, the reality, at least like this, in a <laughs> just uh, yeah dead and here you have um, uh, two monuments to motherland this is in ukraine and this is in uh, in Kiev. this is in uh, volgograd in russia and she is screaming here and don't forget uh, to bring um lace uh, yeah lace panties and here our is saying like oh my goodness she's crazy and things like this and here is, of course, the way how you can catch the Russian soldier. So there were lots of jokes about this, that you just have to give them the washing machine, or maybe we should just donate them washing machines and they would be, I don't know, that would read for you. Uh, it, things like this, because like Ukrainians were really, I would say, shocked uh, when they saw what kind of things were stolen. Like, literally, sometimes it was just a doghouse. Sometimes it was, a, I don't know, a rug. A, I don't know, some very strange things. You would never ever th thought that someone would be really stealing this kind of stuff. Yeah, sometimes the underwear that was already used. And uh, so people got really, you know... Um, Yuri is on one, on one hand, on the one hand. And on the other hand, the other hand they were... It was a great example for the Ukrainians to show this to distance, you know, from Russians again, because uh, if you want to steal these kind of things, that you're not a human, it's not normal. Um, okay, another thing that uh, I would like to talk about is the way how the food influenced, um, you know, how the food was uh, shown in the first part, first stage of uh, this uh, um, full scale invasion. So food as the subject of jokes was no longer um, inanimate, but it has life on its own. It happened when uh, people had to leave their houses and they didn't really know like if they ever come back, you know, can, uh, could come back. And uh, lots of people, me, including me actually, <laughs> left their uh, fridges with uh, Food full of, full of food, yeah, it was borscht, I don't know, it was everything, it was milk, it was dairy products, it was everything. And um, of course, like after a day or two or three, uh, people started to think like, okay, what's going to be with my food when I come back and if I come back? So of course, and that was the first wave when this kind of memes appeared. So in these memes, food can talk make life-changing decisions for example you can it can open your bank account it can launch your own missiles and um, uh, there is a great uh, uh, there is a great meme here about secret bio laboratories from the us in ukraine because at that time the russian media were using lots of lots of uh, propaganda news new report about uh, ukraine as uh, the place where it was a development, like, you know, this uh, of uh, bio biological weaponry, weapons. So memes like this, uh, especially about borscht, appeared. So here you have the phrase, leave your borscht in the fridge for two days uh, for uh, a bolder flavor, but leave it in the, for 22 days and it becomes a biohazard uh, forbidden by all world conventions. So yeah, here we have a guy trying to open the, the, the fridge with the mask, special mask. And here you have this, uh, the, the, what, what is going no, what is going to wait you when you open your fridge uh, once you come, come back home. And uh, so this is uh, also the way how you can maybe express your fear on one hand and on the other hand, try to cope with these fears uh, through love. And also food became a resistance. I think you've heard about the lady that uh, shot the drone was uh, hit the drone with uh, a jar of pickles, but it was not uh, a jar with uh, cucumbers. It was a jar with tomatoes. 
uh, but it started as, as a meme. It, it started as cucumbers. So, and also uh, that's a very interesting example when a person leaving her home wrote a message to the Russian army saying that uh, guess where the poison is. So which food I, I poisoned basically, and then glory to Ukraine. And um, actually there were lots of, um, mm, I would say rumors, some facts, some rumors, some urban legends about uh, grandmothers um, poisoning food, pastries, and then giving uh, them to the Russian soldiers. And then the Russian soldiers uh, yeah, were found dead. So, and for this reason, we have this meme with uh, yeah, a lady trying to yeah, put in some poison and uh, it's written here, liberators, two liberators. And here is a great meme with Zaluzhny calling Baba Hala. And Baba, Baba Hala is saying, yeah, what's, so I'm listening. And he's saying that there is a, a possible attack, the second possible attack uh, on uh, Sumska Oblast. And she's saying, okay, I'm starting to prepare some, to bake some more pastries. So yeah, that's quite interesting to see how food becomes a also a real resistance in this way. And it becomes a weapon uh, when and you see it in different memes. And it's quite um, interesting, I would say, to point out that the gastro memes uh, tell a story of our localized identities as well. Because for Russians, they actually, Russians don't really care about the place where they're going. They don't understand at all where they're going, why they are going there. Yeah, so they are totally unfamiliar about this, uh, I would say, local geography that is uh, being set for us, yeah, as Ukrainians. So because when we hear Melitopol, it's always about cherries. When we hear Kherson, it's always about uh, watermelons and tomatoes. When you hear Mikulayev, it's always about peaches. When you have Bakhmut, it's always about salt and um, uh, champagne and and so on. Yeah, and you, you can continue. But that's that's quite interesting because like once the I don't know every when the spring ends you start waiting for Melitopol cherries like that that's what you do everyone everywhere and and of course for Russians they don't really care about this at all and that's why we have so many memes where you see these cherries or these watermelons or yeah basically getting their revenge and uh, killing the Russian soldiers. And uh, you can also see it in the counteroffense here, for example, because watermelon became a symbol of counteroffense in the South, for example, or with Izum uh, uh, in the um, Kharkiv uh, area uh, district, uh, that's uh, Izum in English, it's raisins. Yeah, also it was a very sim significant uh, symbol. So uh, counteroffensive uh, was a huge, huge uh, part of uh, memes, yeah. And uh, it started in uh, September, like massively in September, when uh, when everything started here in the um, eastern part, when uh, the Kharkiv Oblast started to be cleaned out from Russians. So here you have uh, a typical, <laughs> a very typical way how the Russians would react back then. They were saying that there is no panic at all; everything is under control. Uh, no panic at all. And here you see this meme with no panic at all and how they are running away. Uh, this is one of my favorite memes, actually. So you see the Russians in the uh, uh, in the boat asking like, OK, guys, uh, which river are we forcing? And the answer is the Styx. This is the river uh, from the Greek mythology that you would cross only when you're dead. And uh, here you see some general coming to Putin and saying that the offensive is going according to the plan. And uh, Putin is asking our offensive, right? And um, yeah, of course not. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and this was quite funny because uh, with this map, okay, you could see so many different, very fun um, uh, pictures, for example, with some uh, animals as well. But uh, yeah, that, that can you, here you can see how fast uh, the Ukrainian army was actually approaching and uh, how fast the Russian army was escaping. And uh, yeah, that's about the Ukrainian battle penis isn't real. And then you see the map and you actually, yeah, you can't agree. And this is the meme that is quite also, I would say it's a bit uh, like inner for Ukrainian, uh, like local for Ukrainian uh, people, but it's, uh, it's very, um, I would say it's very interesting to point out that it's actually true that uh, the counteroffensive started in uh, September when all the agricultural um, 
stuff was already being made. So basically, here you see to whom, whom per se, yeah, people uh, that are related, like in a close relationship with like nepotism. So he's saying, one of, saying, is, of him is saying, well, my good man, uh, how come your army waited so long to go to an offensive? And, another, and the other one is answering that they were busy picking potatoes. And actually, uh, if you ask doctors, let's say, doctors, let's say, surgeons about the way when they have some more so less busy time okay with the operations they would actually tell you that uh they are they have uh easier schedules yeah not that occupied with all these uh surgeries when the, you have to plant potatoes and you have to pick potatoes so th this is kind of like a ukrainian religion i don't know we, we are very close to the land it, it's still happening and with the war it started to be even more because People wanted to be more secure about themselves, you know, and if you have your own garden, you would plant some more stuff on it and think about uh, th that's how you can plan something, you know, and feel that more, more stable. And uh, here is the part where I would like to tell a bit more about the Newspeak. So Russia is actively promoting its Newspeak, uh, Novoyaz in Russian. And uh, this is the that started actually I think around three years ago. But when the war, um, the full scale war started, they they turned into something huge. They turned it into something huge. So when the more emotive words are um, are usually used, they are trying to replace them with uh, less uh, emotive terms. So for example, instead of war, they would say special military operation liberation instead of occupation, uh, explosions uh, are called thumbs, and uh, I don't know, and so on. So I've just read news about kidnapping of Ukrainian kids. Of course, they would also call, call it just uh, not the kidnapping, but uh, the replacement of, uh, into the recreation area somewhere deeper in Russia. So in the Russian language, the word thumb, um, just, Klopok, klopok in Russian um, sounds very, very similar to the word cotton, klopok. So the difference is only in the way how you stress the word. So in Ukrainian translation, the Russian word for cotton is bogovna. And uh, it is used to refer to explosions in Russia, only in Russia. So you wouldn't hear that bogovna happened in Kiev, for example. In Kiev, there was an explosion, yeah? But if you hear it about Belgorod or about Kursk and so on, you would hear it as Bobovna. So, uh, or you can sometimes can hear the examples like someone has smuggled a bunch of cotton wool or a cotton flowers, I don't know, into Russia, or the cotton field is in bloom you know, in Belgorod. So things like this. So which, uh, yeah, we use this as a metaphor to not only to mock Russians here in the way how they use their newspeak, but also because they were they kept, uh, you can see it in this meme, because they kept um, lying yeah, uh, to their um, citizens uh, with all these um, fires. So they were saying sometimes that there was, a, it's called Selitra in Ukrainian, in English I found that the translation is salt pit. So, for example, that there was a, a salt pit, uh, that someone was smoking close to the salt pit, uh, I don't know, uh, and uh, that's how it got the explosion. Then you got the information that someone uh, just uh, didn't, uh, so someone just shoot someone and, and things like that. So they would never, never tell you the real story. They would always try to find out something else. So for this reason, you also can hear the examples of Newspeak, how they do it with, um, uh, they are retreating when they uh, run away from Ukrainian territories. They always, always say that that was a goodwill gesture, or it was a regrouping, or this, it was a special maneuver, and things like this. And uh, for this reason, uh, lots of Ukrainians sometimes, when, when, when something happens, for example, with Kherson, there were already jokes like, okay, what? what they are going to do this time, what they're going to say. Is it just a goodwill gesture? Is it a special maneuver? What, what was there? Or someone was smoking again? What, what's the thing? The same was with the uh, warship um, Moscow when they were saying in Moscow that firstly that there was just a small <laughs> local problem there, then that someone was smoking, and then, yeah, then it, it sunk. 
Uh, and uh, the same goes here with Crimean Bridge. There were lots of jokes about someone was someone who was smoking next to the bridge, yeah, and because the the explosion was so so heavy. So for this reason, in this meme, you see a guy with a huge cigarette. Uh, also, okay, we still don't really know for sure how it happened, yeah, but um, because high Mars back then were the uh, on their I would say meme scene. They they appeared here as well. So you see the high Mars saying, "Oh, is it for me?" And uh, there were also memes with high Mars uh, being on this um, very funny uh, uh, ship. Not even a ship. Basically, it's like uh, yeah, inflated ship, you know, or a, a raft. Raft. Yeah, that uh, there was the high Mars on the raft coming to this uh, Crimean bridge. And also, it was it was the way how it was damaged also uh, came into memes. So here, for example, you remember I think this huge, very long table, uh, Putin's table. So you can see it, how it was smashed the same way as the Crimean bridge. And this is um, yeah, also quite popular, I would say, uh, uh, type of memes uh, with like in medieval memes. And uh, yeah, here you can see how they are mocking the air defense system in the Russian army because they're not doing anything at all. And uh, also, of course, there were lots of memes with uh, Zelensky and Zaluzhny and uh, with this lady. This lady was uh, very, very famous from the first um, Bavovna in Crimea, from the first uh, cotton episode, uh, when uh, she was crying in her car saying that she doesn't want to leave uh, Crimea at all because uh, she felt like home there. And uh, here you see uh, she's saying this phrase again, that she doesn't want to leave at all, because there were lots of lots of Russians who came after the annexation of Crimea. So they are now, so basically they are, mm, they got there uh, illegally, they received their apartments illegally, and of course they live there illegally. And uh, once uh, Ukraine got Crimea back, uh, that's going to be a very interesting situation for them, especially if the bridge will be destroyed completely. So here you see Zaluzhny is saying that you won't come anywhere. And uh, right uh, a few days later, uh, there was a huge first serial mass serious massive attack on uh, Ukraine. Ukrainian infrastructure, and there, if you remember, there was also one uh, uh, a missile that hit the bridge in Kyiv. This is the bridge we call them Klitschko's bridge because Klitschko, our mayor, ex boxer, uh, actually uh, was the main um, the person who created this idea, and he got all this uh, idea into the reality. So. Uh, and there were lots of memes about these two bridges, you know, competing who who is cooler. And of course, Ukrainian, like Klitschko's bridge is cooler because it stands still. And there were, even though that there were some glass um, parts there, they were still, okay, of course, they were kind of damaged, but still everything was okay there, and unlike the Crimean bridge. And a bit later, not later, actually the same period of time, we had so many jokes about nukes and about um, the nuclear war that is going to come, and we were waiting for this war to come, and there were, I would say, so many jokes about nukes that uh, I, I picked some of them here. So, uh, first of all, uh, here you had... Um, uh, a stress factor how you have to react basically in the way uh, so when the nu uh, nuclear uh, missile would come so here you say that it's over it's uh, actually it's written here can't then you have very very bad then you have burns and then you say oh okay uh, hands are on its own place so i can uh, donate more for the civil for my for ukrainian army and so actually that people were they were doing with there were lots of memes that uh, once everything started you have to donate more and more and more and more and more so the every news with nukes were always um uh, i would say uh not surrounded but they, they were kind of promoting these donations to the volunteers and the shakavitsa part it's super fun because this is a hill in the historical part of uh, kiev and um uh, there was <laughs> Okay, the guys 
created a chat on Telegram uh, that uh, there is going to be an orgy on Shikavitsa once the nuclear bomb uh, fall in Kyiv. So we have to all uh, meet, we have to meet on Shikavitsa and there's going to be a huge orgy there. And uh, so there were lots of jokes like this, for example, that uh, the Russian would say like, uh, yeah, holes, we are going to hit you with this nukes. And uh, the Ukrainians are saying, okay, guys, so we have to organize the orgy on Shikovitsa. And then they're saying it's not a bluff. And then the Ukrainians, okay, okay. So we have to, yeah, we have to <laughs> basically to decide who is going to be fucked with who and who is going to fuck uh, whom. And here you have uh, Travolta, like legendary Travolta, who is also uh, that he is coming to Shikovitsa a bit too early, but there is no one there. So there were lots of jokes that, is it already the time when we have to meet there? Is it the time that I have to leave for Shikovitsa? So there were lots of lots of jokes about this. And uh, it, it was a huge release factor, actually. So the, the stress release factor. And uh, now, of course, we have lots of lots of jokes about blackout. And um, so that's that's actually that that's one of my favorite ones because it's it's about me. One of the first huge blackouts I spent the same way as this uh, as in this story. So uh, the Russian is saying like we bombed them and bombed them and we keep bombing them and uh, they are uh, under the light of LED 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 lamp on a tourist gas stove. These bastards or oh, there, as he said, are making streams. And uh, yeah, so that even when everything is quite really, really bad, we still would be better than Russians because we would be eating shrimps or some other very expensive food that uh, it's very difficult for them to imagine that you would be eating on your di uh, dinner. Uh, here you have five stages of um, denial, anger, bargain, depression, and generator. You have to buy generator if you want to live normally. And uh, that's uh, one of my favorites too, because it's about Bear Grylls uh, who came to Ukraine and Ukrainians were really lucky that maybe he is good, not, not, not the way that he is going to teach us the survival skills, but we have to teach him the survival skills. So here you have Bear Grylls saying, I came to Ukraine to teach you how to survive and the reaction of Ukraine is like, uh-huh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, and uh, yeah, one of another of the last ones here is that uh, yeah, Russians are screaming like we'll destroy all your infrastructure, and you have Ukrainian fully equipped and prepared with power banks, gas stoves, and all this station power stations and everything, generators screaming, okay, come on, what are you waiting for? So yeah, basically. Uh, so we are making jokes because we don't really want to be scared. Of course, this is the first reaction that you got. Another reaction is, of course, that we want to feel a part of the group. Yeah, because when you laugh together with someone, it's always less scary. And of course, you make fun. And uh, we are critically looking back to our past right now. Yeah, so we have lots of lots of jokes about Russians being undermined. Yes, Russians being dehumanized. And for us, it's completely OK, because we are now in a certain point of uh, yeah timeline when if you don't do it, you won't be alive at all. Yeah. So you have to face the reality that this is your enemy and uh, you have to create your new future without this people at all. And uh, we certainly want to carve a place for ourselves and surround ourselves with the things only that we want and we rethink. So it helps to endure, band together, wait for every Ukrainian territory to be back, to be deliberated. And also then the next step is to reload Russia as a state. And for this reason, my last <laughs> meme is uh, from um, Michael from uh, the uh, office. Uh, there was one episode that when he was saying that it's good. It's a good thing that Russia doesn't exist anymore. So we all are helping here that we are making a wish actually for the next year that Russia won't exist anymore. And this problem will, <laughs> will at least this problem will disappear. And here are some things that I've prepared for you. So this is my article in English about food and humor during the wartime. These are the memes explanations by Dima Malayev. And these are the performance, uh, stand-up performances in English. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you, Daria. That was not only funny, but very quite interesting. Thank you for that.
uh, do you guys okay. have any questions so you can say that it aloud yeah, or if you wish or write it in the chat we can have a little discussion here maybe not yet yeah, you can maybe tell me what's your favorite because uh, of course there were so many of them <laughs> so maybe you can just tell me what what type of memes are your favorite ones i have actually one question for you and uh, we have talked a lot about war related memes but is it only the war we are joking about is it uh, we were used to joke about politics uh, a lot uh, is it something that uh, exists still in our joking culture yeah of course and actually when i collect memes i have um, a special folder for it's called potochne i don't know like current situation yeah and uh so if you remember there were so many memes about for example salt how salt is ex expensive is or about uh, fuel that if you if you have windows um, of your apartment that uh, face that are facing the uh, gas station that you you are keen you can sell your apartment for a huge amount of money and things like this yeah yeah of course there are constantly we see now of course there are so many jokes about new years and about grandfather frost and stuff like this so it's yeah it's a constant thing how big uh, is your collection Seven thousand or something like this. I I stopped counting. <laughs> oh god, <laughs> it's, too, it's too difficult. And it's impossible to follow. You know, to follow all these. Uh, so I follow some telegrams. I uh, but I can't follow Twitter properly at all because uh, that that's super super difficult for me. And still, if something is huge on Twitter, you will see it on Telegram as well. So, yeah, that that's quite difficult. <laughs> Okay. okay we're still waiting for some questions so don't hesitate and don't be shy yeah i see guys was bobovna <laughs> very great yeah um, maybe i'll try to find some Yeah, there were there are of course there are also jokes about the way how how much you have to pay for your landlord, for example, depending on the situation in the country. And there are, there are many memes about yeah, okay, the for example the um, embassies are back, so the price is getting higher now, or the embassies are uh, escaped the city. Okay, now we can pay very low rent, yeah, stuff like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, is it just because, like, in modern society, we have internet and globalization and net networks? So this means they're spreading so fast, extremely fast. If something happen happened today in the morning, just in two hours, we already have a big amount of different memes. But is it first experience with like maps? in during the war uh, in Ukraine in this year war or like before in the history just of world history we have more uh, examples how people um, actually re, I don't know trying to trying to explain trying to make memes according to other events in the history like the first world war or the second one I know there was some like uh, songs and like like something like this, but what about like chosen memes? Is it first uh, first example in the world history? Uh, I guess actually the first example in the world history was around the First World War. It was oh. in the newspaper, but actually lots of things happened around the First World War, and uh, the urban legends are very very similar. Like we have the same plot that is going that was created around the uh, either about Napoleon times uh, wars or about the First World War, and then it's 
it just it, it keeps reviving yeah and uh, with the ukrainian society I, I guess not only the ukrainian society all uh, the world was uh, having this uh, strike of memes with uh, the coronavirus outbreak because it was huge and it was it spreading super fast, yes, and you couldn't sometimes find where the source was. Yeah. And now I, I really miss in this time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was really nice. <laughs> yeah, you never know. <laughs> yeah, but it was and also, for example, I when I was at university, my bachelor work was about the flu pandemic. So, and it was quite fun that uh, back then uh, we also, we had some jokes and already there was the first, I think for me, I guess it was the first period when we got proper internet connection and we got this spread all over Ukraine. And uh, so it was in 2009. And then when the coronavirus outbreak started, you also had the same memes, maybe a bit, of course, more uh, modern uh, in a mo more modern version, but cover, but the same the, the same structures and the same memes appeared. So, but before they were also just like jokes, for example. So there were anecdotes, yeah, jokes, and then they appeared to be in this uh, like, and then demotivators. We all forget about demotivators, but early 2000s that was the time of great demotivators and uh uh we had uh, uh this mm, these proto memes back then maybe i'm too too young and i don't know <laughs> what uh, what is this demotivator <laughs> oh yeah that's proto meme that basically meme but in early stage of ah, internet okay. okay i get it <laughs> <laughs> Memes, but from very early stages with this, yeah. uh, I think Futurama, Futurama used a lot of, uh, yeah, uh, had the inspirational part from, uh, got the, we got inspiration from Futurama at all, uh, a lot. Yeah, it's basically a picture in a black frame and with a white text, uh, yeah, at the bottom. And that's basically it. Yeah. Yeah, motivators, demotivators. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got that all. Yeah, the, the time of life journal and uh, this uh, ICQ and MSN and what was there. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Daria. Uh, that was uh, such an amazing lecture and uh, I hope uh, you really enjoyed it also. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing this evening with us. And hope we will see each other very soon. Uh, we will have a recording of this meeting. Uh, so you can rewatch something on YouTube back then. And I will send everyone the recording and the PowerPoint presentation. So have a great evening, Salon, and Slavo. Thank you, Slavo Kreini. Thank you.